So I've been in Japan for about two days less. And if I've learned anything so far, it's that Americans really have no respect for other Americans in terms of just the intra-American relationship. Anyway, today's talk, today's short talk is going to be on the joint versus the muscle approach and why I think we've all been kind of taking the wrong or at least less efficient and less applicable framework for teaching and learning and applying biomechanics. So when I think of exercise, I think of basic physics, right? So force and moment arm and torque and all those things. And I think of bones. And as a consequence of bones and joints, really, connections of bones, I think of muscles. And things kind of operate in that order, right? Because if we don't have an understanding of physics, then we can't begin to look at motion. And if we don't have an understanding of, um, you know, or if we do have an understanding of physics, the next thing we need to think about is not muscle, right? It's really what the muscle surrounds and what the muscle acts on. And a lot of what I see being taught these days in relationship to biomechanics isn't really, um, isn't really education. It's, it's more like, hey, here are these facts that are taken out of context of really any uh, learning process, and here they are, and do your best to apply them, right? So, you know, people ask questions like, how do I train XYZ muscle group? And what can I do to bring up this XYZ body part? And, I, and you know, I understand the motivation for that. I understand that in many ways, talking about muscles before talking about joints is just a, a sort of convenient way to communicate. And so I understand that. Um, but I think it creates this whole problem of we're, we're throwing out all of this information with zero context for where the information comes from, right? So the second, let's say that like any variable in any exercise changes even slightly, then all of a sudden you're dealing with a completely situ different situation. So for example, if I say, hey, here's this muscle and here's how you train it, and I show you a motion for how to train a muscle, and you know one factor or one variable within that exercise changes, now all of a sudden you may have a completely different recruitment and you can only really understand why that recruitment might change or how that recruitment might change if you need it to within the context of you and your training or your, you know, the training of your client. If you understand physics and joints, if you understand physics and joints and you have no idea what a muscle's name is, then you fully understand what that muscle does. You don't need to know a muscle's name or, uh, you know, exactly where it attaches and what the fucking Latin origin of the muscle is and or even the names of the joint actions, right? You just need to understand like, hey, this thing crosses this side of this joint. And when it moves closer together, when the two points of attachment move closer together, this is the joint action that happens. And as a consequence of that, you can know, okay, because this muscle surrounds this joint, because it creates this joint action, all I really need to do to be able to actually load that muscle is I need to load it in a parallel and opposite direction. So, you know, instead of saying, hey, let's train back today, you can be like, hey, let's train shoulder extension today. And uh, and I realize that that's a little bit ridiculous and far-fetched for a majority of people, and I understand why. But I think that if you're a trainer or a coach, that's certainly the way that you should be thinking. Um, I think this muscle-focused approach, as I said earlier, has created, you know, in, in many ways an indoctrination, which, you know, some camps of people say that they're educating and they're, they're not indoctrinating. I think they're doing the opposite by basically saying, hey, here's this muscle group and here's how you train it. Because like I said, that's not learning, right? Like when you learn something, you become able to understand the process behind that thing. And as a consequence of understanding a process and not just, hey, here's this fact thrown at you. When you understand a process, you understand how it changes across contexts and you understand which context it's more appropriate within. So rather than asking, how do you train this muscle? You should be asking questions like, what is torque? And what is a moment arm and what is, you know, what is the basic joint structure of the shoulder joint? What are the basic joint motions of the shoulder joint and why? Why does the shoulder move a certain way and the hip moves another way? Why, uh, you know, why may one person have this degree of motion and another person may not, right? Those more foundational sorts of uh, first principles are the things that allow you to answer all of the other more superficial questions without having to ask someone else on the internet how you do something now. I realize that a, a vast majority of people are not interested in learning this stuff for the sake of being able to like think through all of the first principles and apply it at a super deep and nuanced level. I get that. But I think if you're someone who's a trainer or a coach, you have a responsibility to take this framework specifically because 
you're not going to ever work with one person, or presumably you're not going to be able to work with one person. And because you're not going to be able to work with one person, or you, sh you know, hopefully you're not working with one person if you're a trainer or a coach, um, you need to be able to apply this information across multiple individuals, and as a consequence, multiple goals in multiple contexts. And the only way, the only possible realistic way that you can do that is if, again, you understand these first principles of basic physics and basic joints uh, uh, and basic joint structures, right? Otherwise, we're basically just throwing out blind facts about X, Y, Z muscle, which may apply to one person and may not apply to the next person that walks into the door. So take a joint focused approach and take a bone focused approach and all of the muscle stuff that you really want to know and you know, that other people want to know, uh, will be answered for you. So today we are hitting a push day, which means chest, front delts accidentally, and uh, triceps. And uh, so we're starting off with incline dumbbell press. Hopefully this fan isn't hitting the mic disgustingly. And uh, I'm going to kind of go over my preferred method of setting people up for incline presses here. And uh, I don't need to do it now because I've done it about two billion times for myself. But whenever I'm setting people up, what I like to do is assess their active range in the press first. So. You know, set a desired angle or an angle that you think might make sense. Go with that. For me, a good incline press is anywhere from 30 to 45 degrees. Not really much higher than that or lower than that. A couple different reasons, most of which just come down to like the 30 to 45 degree range. It tends to be great for, uh, generally speaking, people's amount of shoulder rotation. So I'll have people get into position pull themselves down, be like, okay, so number one, is that comfortable? Number two, how much wiggle room do I have? So if you get to an incline where, you know, you're really high up and you don't have any wiggle room and rotation, you're gonna have a pretty tough time, from a muscular standpoint, stabilizing that motion. So, find that comfortable spot first, and then put the weights in your hands. Because if you don't do that, you may just be putting yourself into a position with weights. It's not going to be within your active range of control. So, in other words, bad idea. So, I'm dealing with kilograms here. I've done two warm-up sets. And this will be my third. What I'll probably do is... Okay, DJ. So these are 26s. So that's like, I don't know, 60 or something. These are the dumbbells that have handles that actually roll, which I don't love, but it is what it is. I think dumbbell as an option for pec slash delt training, pressing, is your best option from an orthopedic standpoint if you don't have access to cables. Because using fixed implements, fixed bars and stuff, not only is it going to introduce a lot more tricep proportionately, but you're not going to have the freedom and the availability to actually use your, uh, your grip freely and rotate your forearms freely. So. I recommend dumbbells, and uh, even the strongest people I know can use dumbbells fairly comfortably if they don't have access to cables. So, another thing too is when you are setting these into position, I like to go kick, kick, kick with one leg, kick with the other, as opposed to kicking with both. You kick with both, could be fine, but it seems a little bit more precarious to me. So every single rep, I'm thinking about sort of lowering down as if I'm pulling into that position rather than 
just lowering the weights, thinking about almost rowing it down under control. So this doesn't too often happen at gyms that I go to in the US, but these are the heaviest dumbbells that they have here. And I believe that these are only, I don't know, 75s or something, 80s. So, anyway, to the discussion around angles, bench angles, this looks to me to be about, you know, just shy of 45 maybe, maybe 40, 35 degrees. And uh, I don't really think that there is a reason to press at an angle higher than that. If anything, maybe 50 or 60 degrees max. You're just looking for a lot of front delt, but you're going to get a lot of front delt really regardless of the angle, to be honest. So, you know, the more inclined you are versus the more declined you are, I tend to just think about that conceptually in terms of pec recruitment. So, the higher the incline, the more upper pec, the lower the incline, the more lower pec. And anything in between is obviously a mishmash. Something else to keep in mind here is that it also depends on, in terms of recruitment, it's not the bench angle that determines recruitment, it's the relationship of the force direction of the weights to you and how are you set up relative to the direction of the weights. So people get very confused if you know, you're using a cable press and you set it up on an incline. You can set something up on an incline visually, but if the force direction on the cable is pulling your arm up as opposed to back, it's going to be more of a lower back thing, right? So you could be doing what looks to be an incline but the force angle, you know, relative to you will dictate that the stimulus is not out of a, a, you know, a typical incline stimulus. So just thought that was something to mention. But the way that I'm doing this here for me and my anatomy, this is a lot of upper pec and front delt. So, another conversation with these guys, you know, specifically free weight and dumbbell pressing is, you know, should you lock or should you not lock? To be honest, in terms of outcome, I don't think that it is a big difference maker. Um, but in terms of pump, um, absolute load that you're using, and all that stuff, I tend to find that not locking or stopping, you know, five, 10 degrees shy of locking is best. And, you know, if I were teaching this motion, from some standpoints, I think it's actually a little bit more advantageous to teach people initially with a locking type of strategy, just because it can be very difficult to coordinate uh, without locking. But the second that someone has that technique down, pretty easy just to tell them to stop a little bit earlier. So, you know, especially if we consider different muscles and which muscles are priority muscles within the press that you're doing, not locking is gonna be a little bit more of a pec specific thing as opposed to a front delt specific thing and an upper pec specific thing. So, you know, lock, locking out might theoretically be better for lower pecs and middle backs because they don't attach to the shoulder girdle, right? They control shoulder girdle motion, but they don't attach to the clavicle or the scapula. They just attach to the upper arm. So they have the potential to control uh, retraction from happening. But, uh, you know, the front delts are basically just going to attach from the clavicle 
into the arm. So, you know, locking out basically is more of a front delt upper pack type thing. And not locking out might be a middle pack lower pack type thing. But in the context of upper pack versus front delt, you know, there's obviously a shit ton of overlap there, but from a mechanical perspective, you could make the argument that not locking gives you a little bit more in favor of the upper pec because it attaches closer to the sternum. So, kind of a somewhat irrelevant rant there, but maybe that, maybe someone found that interesting. Probably do one more of these, three sets total, and uh, move on to some other push stuff for today. Go straight to triceps. What I would say also, in relationship to the conversation around just dumbbell pressing, is I tend to opt for a neutral to semi-supinated grip in the bottom, meaning that I turn my palms toward each other. If you've seen any of the other videos, me talking about forearm position in relationship to elbow mechanics, I find that it's a little bit better on the elbows to move into a neutral or supinated grip um, when your elbow is more bent, and then vice versa for when you're pressing. You know, so when your elbow is extending and straightening, more of a neutral to pronated grip, versus neutral to supinated grip. So some people like to turn the dumbbells, but the dumbbells get really hard to turn when you are pressing heavy weights. So a good sign of a press that is probably too light is a press that you can easily turn the dumbbells with. So last set here, also notice that I kind of just I'm letting the range of motion drop down as I get to fatigue. Your technique is going to kind of go to shit. You try to force that range and uh, you're in too much fatigue or you don't have the ability to do that. You're going to move something else uh, to try to force it. So, moving on to triceps for the day, or at least triceps for now, just going to hit a single arm push down motion. And uh, I'm going to get a quick warm up in. I mentioned this in the video but your warm-up it's a bunch of exercises that are unrelated to the exercise that you're going to warm up for then you best be changing the exercise that you're doing because let I me mean, just think about it logically if you were doing an exercise that was really good for the goal that you are trying to accomplish and be precise about. Why would you ever need anything else to provide a warm-up like that? Like imagine if, I mean, I guess a lot of sports coaches do this because it's just something popular to do, but imagine if like someone was doing Olympic weightlifting and instead of just starting with the bar they started doing bench press. Like, what the, what the fuck are you doing? 
I mean, it's not to say that people at high levels of sports really have a ton of knowledge about biomechanics and physics and all that stuff, but I find that, uh, generally speaking, success can leave some clues. So I'm just going straight into this, not using restraint today. I'm just kind of doing this partial motion. So this may be a, just going to make sure that I'm in the frame here. This may be a good point to talk about, which is not all restraints are created equal. So what does that mean? Well, if you were to use a restraint for training triceps, you would put it around the front of the arm. You would have it pulling 90 degrees kind of away from the arm. That really helps you a lot if you can shove into it the whole time, but helps you the most only at the bottom. So if I'm in a situation where I don't have that restraint or I don't feel like setting it up, which is right now, what I'll do is I'll just do the part of the range that's mostly the vertical part of the range, right? Because I don't really need a ton of help from all of my shoulder tissues to stabilize that, right? There's a lot of things that can depress the shoulder girdle very easily in this instance. It's a very low degree of fatigue. So when I say that I'm doing a, the vertical part of the motion, I really just mean the part of the motion where my hand is moving mostly vertically up to down versus backward. Right, so the bottom of a triceps extension is backward, hand going backward. So in order to counter that backward force, I need something that is essentially holding me uh, or really preventing me from getting pulled forward. So if I move backward, I need a restraint on the front side of my arm to push into this right. You know, forward into. But if I kind of hug the cable station and I make the loading direction really vertical and I make my, the motion of my hand really vertical, I really just have to be able to prevent this sort of shrugging thing for the most part. There's obviously still forces that are pulling my arm forward, but they're far less significant and kind of indirect. So I almost like to keep this cable super close to my uh, opposite side neck. Just be pretty internally rotated in the arm. And then again, just using that vertical part of the range. So, second set here. One more set here per side, and then I'll move on to my second. Which will be a machine press. So, last thing to note about these guys that I wanted to make mention of is a really easy way to identify if a hinge joint exercise, meaning elbow or knee exercise so you know leg extension leg curl and or curling extending with the upper body easy way to tell if those are being fucked up is is the shoulder moving a ton or is the hip moving a ton because if either the shoulder or the hip are moving a ton you are misaligning the motion somewhere Usually it's just direction of the relative to the knee and the elbow. 
if you are loading the elbow and the knee and or the knee in a way that wants to rotate it or bend it sideways then your shoulder is going to move as a consequence to basically buttress that force so if your shoulder has to buttress a bunch of forces for your elbow and for your knee probably no good so that's a little bit of triceps and we'll move on to a chest press on a machine now all right so moving on to machine converging press this cybex machine is just absolutely radical in terms of how nice it is Converging, by the way, just means the load is going slightly into out, so it kind of matches what a natural arm path would be like in terms of, you know, pack stimulus, so any converging press, assuming that your forearms are roughly perpendicular to the handles, it's going to be a really, really pack heavy thing, assuming that you're aiming over your sternum-ish. Obviously, front delts are in the mix, as always, but, um, you know, assuming that your aim is to kind of just follow the machine, just a shit ton of pack here and not much else. Now, went over this in a different video, but um, where you kind of want to ideally set arm angle is so that your forearm can be roughly 90 degrees from the handle and so that your forearm can kind of stay that way throughout the whole range so the input arm about where my hand is going is kind of sort of tilted backward this way so I want my forearm to be a little bit angled down to start because the angle is going to kind of move forward from there so another thing too is make sure that you can actively sort of pull your hands backward off the handles just a little bit Make sure you can actively stabilize that position. So, hands were probably an inch too narrow there. The reason I felt that way is because I felt just a little bit of tricep that I didn't want to feel. So, you know, I haven't used this machine and I haven't really used this machine ever consistently. So, you know, if you're not traveling and you're at the same gym, write down your settings and everything and just notes that are helpful um, but just sort of adjusting set to set is perfectly fine as well right you, you pick certain things up you're on a new machine or a machine you haven't been on in a while every set you just kind of make you know it a little bit better a little bit more optimized for your mechanics and whatnot so the big thing again with converging presses it's just understanding the direction of motion, not just of the machine, but really of your arm, right? Because your arm in any press is converging, meaning this bone is moving inward. So that's kind of what you want to focus on. Focus on the upper arm, don't focus on the hands. You focus on the hands and you're just reaching forward, you're gonna sort of start to over round when you get fatigued. So two main cues for presses in general, but converging presses like this one especially. Number one, shove the elbows inward. Number two, shove yourself back into the seat.
So relative to the dumbbell press, this will be a much more of a whole, you know, total pack type of thing. Reason being that the arm angle is more horizontal. And the pressing angle, even though it you know moves upwards slightly, kind of to what I was talking about earlier about bench angle and arm angle. If I pull my chest up, right, relatively speaking. It's the equivalent of my arm being more in this plane to moving downward that way, right? Because it's about the relationship of the arm to the torso to the loading direction. You know, and last thing here is I really like a thumbless grip. It's just more comfortable, more freedom of motion at the hands. You don't have to restrict yourself by squeezing the handles. So, jumping into overhead, I'm going to get a quick warm up just to make sure my settings are halfway decent here. So I generally speaking, that was too low, like this around my hip, hip height. And if you can, find something to just put the other hand on for a little bit of a brace. So I got my right hand here on this little thing of a jig. I want to do that. The first set here on the right side, I'm going to grab something else with my left hand. So, I'm going to do three sets here. So, we did dumbbell incline, machine converging, normal uh, extension, the arm at the side. And then, last but not least, here we have a overhead extension. Three sets on everything. All sets to failure. I think it's a pretty quick, good workout that you can do. I mean, 100% in a surplus, 100% at maintenance, 100% in a deficit, 100% on vacation, you know, wherever you happen to be. Um, I think I've, I'll stop saying that I've mentioned things before and I'll just be comfortable repeating myself because I think some of these things can use reiterating, but the more precise that you are with your exercise selection, the less volume you're probably going to need for this ineffective growth stimulus or ineffective, quote, maintenance stimulus. So much in the same way that for the single arm push down, I didn't really need 
that restraint, which, you know, would be nice to have the restraint, but I'm on a little bit of a timestamp today and I don't feel like fucking around too much. But uh, you can notice the motion. If you just pay attention to the motion of my hand, it's almost entirely vertical, right? I'm not really aiming to lock these out. So, you know, and your brain is way smarter than you are insofar as you know, understanding the direction that you're moving and the direction of intent that you're moving. So, even if you don't think that you're really trying to lock the weight out, if you're sort of being haphazard about chewing or you're not really thinking about it and you're just doing what you're used to doing, your brain might say, hey, I got to get to the top of this and lock it out. Right, but if you're only aiming upward, then your motion is going to end up looking kind of weird. So, basically, what I would say is aim vertical and don't aim to lock if you don't have a restraint on tricep stuff. Because it ends up doing all sorts of weird things to the shoulder. Oh, wait. Didn't have that And uh, if that didn't make any sense, please ask a question about it, because I'm happy to explain that in a little more depth, if that's a subject that any of you are curious about or want more explanation on. Just a smidge from my last set. Another thing too that uh, is an important note here is, you know, with any sort of cable motion, in terms of its effect on the shoulder, you always just want to look at like, where is the cable pulling and what is it trying to do to my arm? In this case, the cable, at least I think it should be, in line with you know, your humerus, your upper arm. So cable should be roughly parallel to your upper arm because if it's not, it's going to be trying to rotate your shoulder in all sorts of directions that you don't really want to have to deal with in a triceps exercise, right? This is not an exercise for lats or teres or rear delts or anything like that. So, you know, although those tissues will stabilize the shoulder girdle, we're not trying to fatigue them. We're trying to fatigue triceps. So what I would recommend is you line the cable up parallel to the humerus. So most of the force is just trying to basically shove the humerus back into its socket. You can sort of picture it in its overhead position. It's really just shoving the shoulder joint into itself. But of course, on top of that, you have motion of the arm and you're creating force into triceps, uh, into the triceps via like moving your elbow and extending your elbow. So those forces are basically trying to pull your, um, you know, in terms of like, as soon as you push into the handle, your shoulder is going to want to get pulled backward, meaning pulled behind your head. So, what I like to do, basically think about just sort of reaching my elbow to the sky the whole time. All right, so in this instance, my arm is gonna, you know, gonna, it's basically gonna try to, it's gonna be pulled toward my ear. And so I wanna keep it rock solid, sort of away from that position if I can, right, because you don't want other shoulder stuff doing the work for you. So, you know, when your arm is here and you go to extend, the force of this is obviously to some degree at the bottom, depending on where your arm is, might try to pull your arm down, but it's also going to try to sort of yank your arm because of the cable it's pulling behind you. It's going to try to yank your arm behind you. So you have some competing things happening here and 
you know, the forces can change depending on where you are in the range and where you're set up relative to the cable. So those are kind of my rules is like cable parallel to humerus for the most part. And then just thinking about that sort of straight line of movement where I'm pulling my elbow toward the sky. Hopefully that's a little bit easier to see from this angle in terms of cable parallel to upper arm. And me sort of chewing elbow to the sky the whole time. <laughs> 